talking from a few thousand miles away. That's such a pastor for you. Such a senior pastor for you, let me put it that way. So we've been in this Unite series. We've been talking about this, uh, what it means to live a life worthy of the calling we've received, to let go of the old, to step into the new, to become and live into the new creation. Uh, and cooperate with what God is doing by embracing what he's doing in our lives, by helping to bring forth the best from us and the best from others. This morning, we are in Ephesians again. You know we do this, give everyone pure queso, so we're right there, Ephesians, everyone. Uh, We're on 1822 in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to take a look. Verses, chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And on to into 5, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you all pray with me? Lord, we do pray that in this time you would open our hearts and our minds, our ears and our wills to you to your presence, to your truth, and your leading. In Jesus' name, amen. So one day, the girls and I were out and about. I don't remember where we were or what we were doing, but there was a woman there who scolded her kid for saying something that wasn't very nice. One of my kids decided to add to the conversation and said, my mom says bad words. So I started looking for a door and checking my clock and finding any excuse to get out of there, but I wasn't finding any. I was caught right there. And so I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what's going to happen now. So I leaned down, I, rehearsing every conversation my kid might have heard, of course. I leaned down and I asked my little girl, I said, what are the bad words mommy says? <laughs> and very, very nervous at this moment because I really genuinely don't know what she's going to say. And she said, you say the S word? and the B word. I was like, okay, you won't get in trouble. What's the S word? She said, stupid. I was like, whoo. What's the B word? She said, but. (laughs) Said, okay, you're right. You're absolutely right. The word stupid is an awful, awful word. And it's not a word I should ever use. So thank you for pointing, out to, pointing that out to me and helping me do better. I said, now, the other word, but. Now, and for you guys, this, I hope this, nobody's feeling offended right now because where I grew up, that was the clean word, okay? Um, and so, uh, so I said, who told you this is a bad word? And she said, my teacher. And I said, well, what are you supposed to say instead? She said, we sit on our booties, heinies, bobos, uh, rear ends, bow heinies, bootays, or our pockets. I was like, oh, gotcha. My kindergartner completely schooled me on appropriate language in that moment. We think about when we grow into the new creation, this is something we begin to think about is letting go of an old way of talking and stepping into a new way of talking. Um, And so, as Christians, sometimes we think we need to start cleaning up our language, and oftentimes we do. But we still stub our toes, don't we? And we still need something to shout out loud in that moment. So we say stuff like, oh, fudge, right? Or flippin'. We say stuff like, um son of a biscuit eater. Or, and you know it was some Christian somewhere who invented this concept, H-E double hockey sticks, right? We say, and we think putting the word holy in front of anything else makes it a clean, appropriate, Christian-friendly, non-secular cuss word, fully accepted, right? So, holy cow, holy smokes, holy moly, holy guacamole. 
It's all okay if we put holy in front of it. And that's the kind of things we end up exclaiming. Or now we end up throwing up one of these <laughs> and letting it say everything for us, don't we? For the record, I do want to say this. Colossians, Ephesians, James, all actually multiple places all through the New Testament, we are told that part of growing into the new self is letting go of coarse joking, letting go of foolish talk, letting go of obscenity and filthy language. And it was Jesus himself who said that what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And the good that comes out of us comes from the good that is a good person has good things flow from the good places inside them. An evil person has evil things come forth from the evil that is within them. And it was Jesus himself who said, you will be held accountable for everything that you say. So when we come to a text that talks about unwholesome talk, this is the kind of thing we immediately go to first. And I want to tell you all, it is about way, way more than saying cuss words or clean cuss words. It's so much more than that. The Greek word that Paul used here is sapros. Sapros. It means rotten or withered, rancid or putrid. Something that spoils and taints and turns and affects everything around it. Something that offends everyone around it. But what we're told in this text is that we are instead supposed to only say things that are useful for building others up according to their needs. That means not according to our needs. If we're trying to compliment or praise or build somebody up for our purposes, then we're really just manipulating them, aren't we? And that's not the kind of people we want to be. We're not talking about empty praise. We're not talking about uh, disingenuine flattery. We're not talking about that. Last week, uh, I, I think it bears repeating, We talked a little bit about how we get to be truth tellers and how we are actually called to be people who speak and tell the truth. And truth telling is never a license to unduly hurt or criticize or wound someone else. It's never licensed to tear down or destroy and then call it truth. Because we are specifically instructed in scripture to build others up. So we talked about that, building others up by telling people who they are. So those of you who were here last week, who may have got to hear that message, what have you done or said differently as a result of it? Has anything changed for you? Have you told those around you who they are? Have you spoken that truth to them? Have you told them who they are in Christ or who they are to you or what they mean to you? Or let's take a step back and ask, do you believe for yourself yet? Are you clear on who you are and who you are in Christ? We need to be people who also begin honestly by speaking the truth to ourselves so that we can foster the good that's within us and it can flow forth more freely. So I invite you all right where you're sitting to repeat these words after me. You're welcome to close your eyes. You're welcome to sit with your palms open and allow these truths to just land right there so that you can hold on to them. You're welcome to just proclaim it in your heart or proclaim it out loud. You're going to proclaim it out loud, but really own it fully. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. Um, I invite you right where you are to repeat these words. I am chosen by God. I am wanted by God. I am welcome and invited. I am more than a servant. I am a friend of the King of Kings. I am healed. I am loved. I am cherished. I am more than a conqueror. I am powerful. I am forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven when we seek forgiveness.
from Christ. And you know what? Who, what we are, who we are, and all boils down to this. We are forgiven sinners who are called to forgive sinners, right? That's it. We are forgiven sinners who are called to forgive sinners. We are forgiven people who are called to forgive other people. Romans 5, 8 says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When Christ died for you, consider this, had you yet repented? No. Were you, had you said you were sorry for your sins yet? No. Had you changed your behavior? No. Had you done anything to earn that forgiveness? Absolutely not. And y'all, this is where it gets hard and it gets very real. As Jesus followers who try to do what Jesus did, who live in an apprenticeship relationship with the Lord, if we want to know what he did, all we have to do is look at scripture. He was still suffering on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. And nowhere in scripture do we have any evidence that they were repentant, that they were regretful, that they were sorry, that they had sought any sort of forgiveness. And yet, it was offered to them in that moment. The model that we have from Jesus is that the forgiver pays the price and the cost of forgiveness, even when the forgiven does not understand and is unaware of that cost. Others hurt us. We get angry, we get sad, we get confused, we get hurt, we can feel betrayed. Those are all natural responses to being wounded, to being hurt, to being abused, to being a victim. Those are all natural responses. And we don't want to stay there. So even so, we have to do the hard work of forgiveness. The burden is on us. The responsibility is on us. And that doesn't seem fair, does it? It doesn't seem fair, it's not fair, and it doesn't make sense. But let's consider what happens when we forgive. To forgive is to let go of resentment, to no longer hold someone's wrong or debt or sin or trespass against them. So when we, when we forgive, it does not mean that we condone their behavior. It does not mean that we... Um, excuse them for what they've done. It does not mean that we really release them from consequences or repercussions of their behavior. What it means is we release them to God. And we allow God to take care of them and deal with them. And we release ourselves from the harmful effects of unforgiveness. And we create space then for God to do something wonderful and beautiful in us, in them, and in our relationship, in community. And the truth is, the sad and hard truth is, you may not feel healed, you may not be healed. God's not going to leave you alone in your pain. You may not feel like you're, that, you're ready to close that chapter. You may not feel that forgiveness is, is suddenly there. Does that make sense? You may not feel the forgiveness. You may still be a little angry. You may still be pain. But forgiveness isn't a feeling. It's not just a couple of words. It's a decision. It's a spiritual discipline. It's a way of living. So how do we do it? Greg Jones, who is the director for the Center of Reconciliation at Duke University, has done extensive, extensive work in this area and uh, co-wrote a book with a um, man from Rwanda several years ago where there was great, great genocide and civil war. And the two of them came together and wrote a wonderful book. We, we studied this as a church a few years ago. And out of this comes six steps, and I want to share them with you today. Number one, speak the truth. Name it, call it what it is, but also be patient in the process because it takes time to go talk to people. Why is that such an important thing? Because Jesus said it's such an important thing in Matthew 5. It's more important than our taking our offerings to God in worship, more important to go to those that we have something against or that have something against us. 
Number two, acknowledge your emotions. Acknowledge that you're angry. Acknowledge that you've become bitter. Acknowledge that you're resentful. Own your own desire to overcome these things so that they no longer have a hold on you. And number three, move from demonizing or dehumanizing the person that feels like your enemy. And begin instead to see them as a child of God, as a person of sacred worth, as someone who is beloved and an image bearer of our Lord. Number four, recognize your role in the situation. Often it is not just them. It's often us too. So recognize your role, recognize your complicity in the situation. Now there are times when we have no complicity in something that happened to us. When we were a victim of abuse or a crime or even an accident. And that's when we own who we are. Our identity in Christ. Number five, Commit to changing what's contributing to the conflict. Commit to changing what's contributing to the anger or the bitterness. And number six, confess your desire for reconciliation. First to God, because all sin is against God, right? And then second, to others. Y'all, this is the heart of the gospel. It really is. It's, it's so complicated and yet so simple. Colossians 1 offers a fantastic before and after picture. Before we were alienated from God, we were enemies because of our behavior. After, after, however, we are reconciled to and with and through Christ. After, we are holy in his sight. After, we are without blemish and we are free from accusation. We are called you all. Each one of you is called to the ministry of reconciliation as an ambassador, as a representative for Christ. And without the ministry of reconciliation, without reconciliation, there can be no unity. It's impossible. We cannot be united as a church. We cannot be united as couples. We cannot be united in our friendships. We cannot be united in our families. We cannot be united at work if there isn't reconciliation, if there isn't forgiveness. One leads to the other. The other cannot happen without the one. And what we're told in this sermon series is, is that unity is worth the hard work it takes to get there. There is strength in unity, and we glorify God in beautiful, beautiful ways when we are united. But let me tell you, on the other side of forgiveness is some hard stuff as well. If you have hurt someone, if you have wronged someone in word or deed or even attitude, go to them, talk to them. Own up to what you've done. Don't go justify it. Don't go explain it. Don't go say, I just want you to know where I was coming from. Go. And I would also recommend don't just go and do like my kid does sometimes. I actually did just last night. And just stand there and say, sorry. That doesn't equal reconciliation. And the word sorry really doesn't do, doesn't accomplish, doesn't mean anything in a context of relationship. There's two steps to this one. So go and apologize. And apologizing is not the same as seeking forgiveness. Do both. We have another before and after picture in Psalms 32. David had sinned, uh, he was struggling, unwilling to confess, um, he was weak, he was miserable, he was groaning day and night because of this guilt. He finally got to that point where he confessed his sin and then after, his guilt was gone. Forgiveness had come, he was free to move forward and move on to other things. We want the same thing in our lives. I want the same thing for you. I don't want you to be held back and bound to those that you have hurt or those that have hurt you by the hurt. So if you're not aware of what you may have done, ask God to reveal it to you. If you're feeling a little funky vibe between you and somebody else, 
just go ask the question. Just go and say, you know what, you mean a lot to me and things feel a little weird. I just want to know that we're okay. Is there anything I need to do? Is there anything I've done? Just be brave and go ask the question. Because what you get in the end, reconciliation and potential for unity, is worth the hard work of forgiveness and seeking forgiveness. You all, we are called, per this text, to be kind and compassionate, to build one another up according to their needs. It's how we preserve unity. It's how we unite as forgiven people who forgive people. Again, it's the very heart of the gospel. So let me just say this. Um, as an itinerant pastor, we are uh, sent by the church, and we go where we're sent, when we're sent. It's the model that Jesus used with his first followers, with the early disciples. It's the model that the early church used with the first apostles as they were building the church, and the church was spreading. The kingdom of God was taking root, and beautiful things were happening. And it happened because people were sent out to share. So what we do as itinerant pastors is we go where we're sent, when we're sent. And a lot of you do this in your everyday lives. So it's fortuitous that we've got to spend this time in Ephesians, and I've got to study and read out of these texts. Paul had great affection and great partnership with the church at Ephesus. He was there for three years at one time. Um, he had been there uh, multiple visits, way over three years when you put it all together. Acts 20 um, offers some of Paul's parting words of farewell to the leaders and people of Ephesus before he went on to do ministry in other places. And so if I may, I want to do the same for you all. With just a teeny bit of advice, a little bit of preachiness, and maybe a tear or two, so please forgive me. I just want to encourage you all not to take yourselves too seriously. Make sure you have fun. Cultivate joy. Cultivate gratitude. Be happy. Laugh. Laugh at yourself. Laugh at other people if you have to. Doesn't matter. Laugh. Outdo one another in doing good, in showing honor. Don't grow prideful in that, but outdo one another, trying to be the very best that you can be as you serve. I want to ask you all and encourage you all to build up with your words, with your behaviors, not to tear down, not to destroy, not to discourage, not to take one another out at the knees. It happens in community. But we can do better, and we can be better than that. There's never a good reason to tear down or destroy. Because remember, when we do, we're all part of one church, one body. When we do that, we hurt ourselves, we hurt others. And it's the opposite of what Scripture calls us to do. So build up and encourage, just as our text says to do today. And I also want to say, we've got a lot of fantastic young people in this church. Tremendous gifts, tremendous potential, tremendous calls that God has placed in your lives. I want to encourage you, church, don't make those who are younger than you earn a place in the body. Don't make them earn a voice in the family. They get that. It's part of being part of the family. It's part of being united with one another. There's tremendous opportunity. Instead of handing over the keys to the kingdom or withholding the keys to the kingdom, there's tremendous opportunity in partnering and fostering and mentoring and seeing what sort of great things can come when we're united across our age barriers. By the same token, I encourage you all, don't hold those who are older than you in contempt. Guess what? They can't help it. Truly, don't hold them in contempt. Or disregard them because they're not hip or relevant. Relevant to whom? They're still relevant to the body, rele relevant to you, relevant to Jesus, because they are still fully here. Don't disregard those who have come before you or tear down what they've built because then you can't build on that. 
and we never get closer and we never get higher. I encourage you all to, right now, just where you're sitting, take a look around. Who's normally sitting around you that isn't there? Is anyone missing? On a day like today, we've got a lot of folks missing with cold, icy weather. Pay attention, notice, reach out. Let people know they were missed. Let people know that you pay enough attention to them when you spend an hour sitting near them every Sunday morning. Let people know that they matter. Reach out to them and figure out if there's a need that needs to be met. And see if the Lord can use you to be the one who meets that need. I also want to remind you very quickly, I, it's something I say all the time, I just want to say it here as well, that everyone is made in the image of God. Everyone has an inherent dignity, a dignity that no sin can take away or undermine, a dignity that commands our respect and our attention, and when we start dividing people into the haves and the have-nots and the deserving and the undeserving and the cool and the not cool and the insiders and the outsiders and the wanted and the unwanted and the forgiven and the unforgiven and the clean and the unclean, we are not working toward unity and we are not working within God's will because God doesn't look at us that way. And we don't need to look at each other that way. I also want to say, I want to say this. Um, uh, from my heart to your heart, I want to encourage you all to empower and raise up your girls and your women for ministry. I just want to say it because I can and they can fire me if they want. But you know, in 55 years, Asbury has never had a woman or a girl come out of this church into fully ordained ministry. I would love to see that changed. Because I look across this room and I see tremendous gifts. I see tremendous knowledge of scripture, tremendous anointing as teachers, very, very likely as preachers and pastors and shepherds. There is so much that God has placed within us. And remember that good that comes from the mouth comes from deep within. I encourage you all to raise up your boys and your girls, your men and your women to be proclaimers of truth. Amen? We can do that, right? We can totally do that. And I want to also tell you all, I would love to see my sweet, sweet little baby girl, Emma Grace, she's four. Uh, she took her first steps, literally her first steps in this church building. So from now on, we're going to drive by and she's going to say, that's where I learned to walk. And it's absolutely true. And I want to encourage you all to be a church where baby steps are okay. Amen? Be a church where baby steps are okay, where a baby step of forgiveness or a baby step of um, obedience, a baby step of biblical knowledge, where all of those are okay. When we start dividing people into insiders and outsiders and good and not good, when we get this dichotomous thinking in our minds, we do so much damage. And you know what? People are not going to come into a church that does that. New believers, unbelievers, people who haven't yet met Jesus are not going to come into a place where they are made to feel less than or where they're made to feel unwelcome or they're reminded. Let me tell you all, I was not raised in church. I was raised in a home where Jesus and Christmas had nothing to do with each other. It was all about Santa and Rudolph. I'm not kidding. Um, I was raised in a place where I was told that the Bible was a bunch of lies. Look at me. God worked in my life, but I know what it is to walk into a church, to a community of faith, to a class, and to be made to feel like an outsider because I don't know how to flip to the right thing in my Bible. Y'all know that feeling. I know what it is to be made to feel like an outsider because I don't know when to stand up and sit down because I don't know when to, um, that, that in church everybody evidently shakes hands with everybody around. I know what it is to be made to feel like an outsider because I don't know the language or I don't know the lingo or I don't understand the Trinity because I don't understand all the abbreviations or know how to navigate the building. You all be a church where baby steps are okay. And that means you've got to be a church where hospitality and warmth and welcome 
and letting people go slow and being okay with people who haven't figured out how to clean up their language or clean up their behavior is okay because that's what Jesus did, isn't it? That's what Jesus did. He didn't hang out with all the righteous people. He hung out with those who didn't know yet, to those, with those who hadn't had the love of God revealed to them yet. Be a church where baby steps are okay, where we don't all have to run fast, but we can grow bit by bit by bit. Also, I want to encourage you all, be a praying church. Be a praying church. It is, I believe, one of the single most important things you can do. It's the most important thing you can do with your kids. It's the most important thing you can do with your spouse. I think it's one of the most important things we can do as a church. Be a praying church. And I got to say it, Jesus, 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 more Jesus. Does that say everything? And then George is going to put up the Apostles' Creed on our screen. And I want to ask you all just a couple of questions as you consider this. I want to ask you all to consider, again, who you are and what you believe and what truth is. So I want to ask you, we don't say this all the time in this service, but I want to ask you, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Do you believe that he's the maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord? Do you believe he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate? Do you believe that he was crucified, dead, and buried? Do you believe that on the third day he rose again? Y'all, that is so much. That's one of the things that defines us. That. Do you believe that he rose from the dead and he ascended into heaven and he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? Do you believe that he will someday come to judge the quick and the dead? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Universal United One Church? Do you believe in the communion of saints? Do you believe in the forgiveness of sins? Do you believe in the resurrection of the body? Do you believe in the life everlasting? Amen? Amen? Amen! Preachers, we got a million things to say, especially on our last Sunday on the platform. I want to encourage you all to seek the best for one another, to remember these truths we just spoke, and live your life out of those truths. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're going to sing a closing song. I invite you all, if you would like, you are welcome to come and to sing. Come and sing. Well, you can do that too. You are welcome to come and pray if you need to. If there's anything that you need to take care of, any bitterness, anger, frustration, disappointment, woundedness, I invite you all to come and allow the Lord to heal your hearts. Amen.